everyone today on this Resurrection Sunday. I pray that your spirit is, is hungry today. I, I pray you're thirsty for the word. We got a bit of word to teach you today. We got something to talk about today. And it's going to affect everybody in here. And it's going to talk about everybody in here. I'm going to bring some things up that I don't think that I didn't even realize that I do sometimes. But the, the word's going to teach us how we all capable of it. And we all been doing this. In Romans chapter 12, verse 14, we finished off dealing with our text out of practical Christianity. In that particular text, Paul has been teaching us from Jesus' writings how we are to treat our enemies and our friends. We have found ourselves now in Romans 12 and 15. Romans 12 and 15 was actually a continuation from 14. If you, if you were here last week, you understand where Paul grouped his writings at. He grouped his writings where 9 through 13, 9 through 13 was about, they were all dealing with the idea of love. Now in verses 14 through 16, he's dealing with a total different idea of the believers, how we treat relationship, how we do towards each other. In this text of scripture, I started us off out of Matthew 7 and 12. And we looked at what was considered as the golden rule. And we talked about that first and foremost because it led us where we are. Matthew 7 and 12 says, Therefore, whenever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. What he's getting our minds set up to do is how we treat each other relationship-wise. What do we do? How do we do? He wants to, Paul wants to change our thinkings through Jesus' teachings. Now, we actually want to consider this as the laws of the one and others, the law of one another. In John 15 and 12, it says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. In Galatians 6 and 2, it says, bear one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. Ephesians 4 and 32 says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. And in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 11, it says this, Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as I also are doing. I didn't want you to write this down. I wasn't worried about you getting this because I just want to lay the groundwork to where we are. Romans chapter 12, verse 15 says this. Romans 12 and 15 says this. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And weep with those who weep. Bow your heads and let's have a prayer. Our Father and our God, we enter your throne of grace just as humbly as we know how. First and foremost, Father, we thank you for the life that you have prepared for us and given us. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to see this resurrection Sunday and let us, us understand your will and your way and know that your protection and your love kept us. Now, Father, as we begin to study this, your word, I pray that the hearts and the minds of your people are, are sifted. I pray you give them fertile ground for this seed of the word to be planted in so that it may bring a harvest of an attitude change, of a lifestyle change, of a new walk in your word. God, I just pray that you just be the God that you've always been with your hedge of protection around this, your people, and just guide us. And, and, and most of our Father, just assure us that, that you are the God that's on the throne. Give us the signs. Give us the wonders. Just let us see your wonders work in this world. And we'll be ever so careful to give you all praise and all the glory and all the honor. Let every heart say amen. amen. Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice. In our text, we started looking at this last week and we started to deal with it. And before we got too deep into the idea, he brought up this powerful question. He says, first and foremost, as we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep, we must deal with this thing or this attitude that's entitled sympathy. It says you must be sympathetic to people before you can actually do this, do this concept of rejoicing and, and having this one another idea or this one another thought in your mindset. When he dealt with sympathy, he brought us or he led us into the word that we got stuck on last week, which was empathy. Now, we gave you a definition for sympathy, and it involves the understanding from your own perspective. That means I understand what you're going through in my perspective. But then we bridged over to the word empathy, and empathy teaches us this. 
Empathy involves putting yourself in the other person's shoes, understanding why they have particular feelings. So he says he wants us to understand as Christians, as believers, we have to learn not just to sympathize with people, but we have to learn to empathize, put ourselves in their shoes. Sometimes we judge people from the outside because we don't know. Our sympathy only leads us to see on the outside. But the empathy will make us be part of you. I see your situations. I see what you're going through. I see what's happening. See, when you look at it from a sympathy point of view, I may say I'm sympathetic to you because your loved one passed. But then I have to put myself in you to feel what you're actually going through. That's why truly and honestly, homegoing services should actually, a church family should pack a homegoing service out. Because we as family members of each other, we should feel what each other's going through. We should be there to comfort each other and be there around each other. I hate to keep going back to where it used to be, but back at one time in earlier lifestyle, they were. Churches were more family oriented and everybody knew everybody. So when one of the family members died, it was like it was your family member. So that was the reason why we could, he's talking about this, this, this thought of being family. Now, he moved from that thought or he moved from that concept that he's going to get us to where we're going to look at today. Paul actually says we have to learn two different things as we deal with this. And he says first it was a sympathetic identification with those who rejoice. He says you got to be, you, you got to feel what people feel when they're rejoicing. When they get a promotion on the job, it's got to be like you got a promotion. You got to feel a promotion just like they felt the promotion. And that way you can actually rejoice with them. But we've got in a, in, a, in a way so far now that we don't feel what each other feels, so we can actually can't do that. What that does is that weakens the family of God. Because now we're all islands unto ourselves. Everybody's doing something different. Everybody's going a different way. And when things happen, we don't know who each other is. We don't know about who each other is, and we don't know what's going on with each other. And when I say knowing what's going on with each other, I don't mean being in their business where you have to know every detail. I mean be close enough to them that you can share a prayer with them, that you can give them an embrace, that you can see what's something going on. I grew up in a, in a moderate-sized moderate family, but my mother knew her children, and she knew each one of us, and she could look at us and tell when something's going on with each one of us. We should be the same way as the body of Christ. We should be able to see a member, know when a member is hurting, and be able to give an encouraging word. Yeah. Weep with them when they're weeping and rejoice when they're rejoicing. But you will only be able to do that when you establish sympathetic identification. Now, here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. Here's the thought. The phrase speaks of the believer being sincerely glad for blessings of others. In our text of Scripture, when it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice. He's actually saying that we as Christians have to learn to be true to who we are. We have to be learned to be true in our feelings, our words, and our emotions. When you say, I love you, you got to mean it. The text says, be not hypocritical in your talk. So when I say I love you, it's got to be from me, from the inside. We've learned and we've studied earlier that love is not an emotion, but the emotion is born out of love. Love, if it was all emotion, they would, God, Jesus would have never commanded us to love because he can't command emotions. He says, the greater, he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. He means he's commanded us to love. So he couldn't command an emotion because an emotion would go against the will. Now, he says all of that to say this right here. He says it often goes against the, the grain of human nature for, for mankind to rejoice with those who rejoice. The reason why we can't do it is the number one reason is this. Ms. Paul, sometimes we do not rejoice for others due to envy. Due to envy. We're going to park the bus here for a brief moment because I think this is where it's going to get a little deep hit here. Envy is the art of counting other people's blessings instead of your own. See, when it comes to envy, we worry about what others do instead of worrying about what's coming to you. 
Let's go a little farther. Envy is an emotion that is largely unconscious in most people, but it can come from being focused on other people's successes and wanting to bring them down because of it. Envy is a subconscious act that happens in each and every one of us. We don't understand it or we don't see it, but that's the reason why it's so powerful. Here's the thing about envy. Here's the thing about envy. It says it's an emotion and it's, in, it's unconscious emotion. That means in your, in your, and not in your forward thinking, but in the back of your mind, you have, a, you have a mindset or way of looking at things that causes the issue. So in my thought, in my process of envy, I'll see you prosper, but in other words, it's, I won't actually rejoice with you. Now, here's the definition that I want you to hold on to for envy, and it's going to give us an idea or take us where we should be. Envy is, is actually, a simple definition of envy is to want what belongs to someone else. When you envy someone, that means I actually want what you got. We mix the word up envy with jealousy so often, but that's not the same word. Jealousy and envy have got so tied together that we, we mix them up, but they're not the same. Envy, jealousy are so closely related and sometimes used interchangeably in the modern Bible translations, but they are not quite synonymous. Envy is the reaction to lacking something that another person possesses. Jealousy is the reaction to the fear or threat of losing something or someone we possess. So, envy is the distress, resentment we feel when others have what we want. So, he's saying this right here. To rejoice with others when they rejoice, envy sets in and we want their rejoicing. We don't want to rejoice with them. We want what they want. See, instead of me being happy for you, I'm back here thinking, why didn't it happen to me? I do. I, 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 Lord, I get more time than she do. They barely come to church. They barely show up. I've been good all week and they've been wrong. How they get blessed and I don't get blessed. We tell ourselves that. We, 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 look, at, we look at saying, why, why, why this happening to them? And I've been better than they have. Yeah. Yeah. Envy does that to you. It makes you look at things that way and see things that way. So he says, to rejoice for others that rejoice, envy actually sets in and it won't allow you to do that. Jealousy, on the other hand, is what actually is, 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 is actually dealing with the thought that what you already have and your protection of what you got. When I'm jealous of somebody, when I'm jealous of something, I'm holding on to it and I'm worried about somebody taking what I've got. The only other words that you can actually closely relate to envy is actually the word that we get coven or covetousness. Covetousness is basically the same thing. It's actually a strong desire for something someone else's have. Envy is so powerful, and the Bible speaks of it in several passages of Scripture, but one of the main things it wants you to understand is envy was actually one of the seven deadly sins. It was put on high because we all do it, and we don't understand how we do it and when we do it. We do it a lot of times, and it slips out, and we don't really aware that we're doing that. So, Here's the thought. Here's the thought that I want you to think about when we deal with envy, the emotion of envy or how it deals with us. It tends to be shadowy. It tends to be unconscious. It can be passive aggressively, and it, and it can be hell-bent on destroying or what it can have. Even generally involves two people. The envious person may deeply want what the other person has and feels frustrated at not being able to have it. The envious person can have the act and the frustration, but then he subtly, in other words, he, has, he slowly, slowly builds up resentment to the person who has the gift. A writer once said that the reason why envy is so dangerous is because while we're looking at others, we can't look for the blessing for ourselves. While I'm worried about your blessing, I can't even look for my own blessing. Instead of looking at it saying, and what was the songwriter used to say? What God has for me, it is for me. Instead of looking for my own blessing, I'm worried about your blessing. So I'll never be able to grow because I'm worried about what you're getting. 
Envy is just that dangerous that he says we all do it, and we all do it in a way that it, it, that it, that it affects our lifestyle. Here's a thought that it, it dropped on us about envy, or what the Bible actually teaches us about envy. It says, the Bible says that envy in its act of the flesh is the result of a human sin. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, and orgies are like, are like that. And I warn you, as I did before, to those who live like this, not, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, with, with envy, it's just like with the rest of the deadly sins. He says, you will never be able to inherit the kingdom of God with envy inside your spirit. Now, the thought of envy or the thought of each and one of us having envy, he said, is the, is the ideal. How do, you, how do you approach envy or, or how do you know when envy is coming to you? Can you actually identify when you're beginning to feel envy? See, when envy is coming your way, do you really know that it's coming to you? See, see we, we, we think so far that we, we think we Holy Ghost feel and, and, and we are all great in the Lord. But do you understand when envy slips into your lifestyle, do you recognize it? Can you recognize it? He wants us to understand this. He said, this key to envy is we got to learn how to identify it so we don't have to go through it or we won't have to deal with it. Yes, ma'am. In, anytime you want what somebody else wants is envy. Now, if I see you with a new car and I, and I, and I start to cover it, I want it, and, and, and I can't rejoice with you in your new car. Instead, I talk about you or I bring up things about you because I want the car or I want a new car too. That's what he's talking about when he says with this envy right here. He says we can't rejoice with each other is because we have an envy and an envious spirit in ourselves. See, because I want what you got, I don't want to see you with it. I'm not going to rejoice with you with it. So when Paul says rejoice with those who rejoice in Romans 12 and, 12 and 15, he's saying that we can't do it because of envy. I have a hard time, have a hard time with this idea, he says, of rejoicing with you when I'm really trying to say I should have what you have. I want what you got. It should be me. So he's saying this. This thought that he's talking about, he said, this is what affects most of us or most Christians. We deal with this attitude. Yes. Yes. And, 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 and see that thought or that, that, that concept that you're talking about is actually what's born out of the envy. See, what it is is we, those who are being told to shade on or those who the people are showing envy to, we have to recognize when they show envy. But here's the key. You still got to be the Christian. Just like he took us back to the earlier text in Romans 12 and 13 and 14, it's a certain way we got to act no matter how they treat us. Matter of fact, remember we dealt with it, our attitude towards our enemies. See, it's never about what they do is what we do when they do it to us. How you respond when they do it to you. But in this text, Paul is teaching us that we should rejoice, but he also left the door open when we don't rejoice. The people that don't, the people that still been blessed, how do you act? So in other words, there's... When you've got the blessing and things have gone your way and nobody rejoices with you, how do you feel? Yeah. See, do you, do, you, do you bless God and keep going no matter what people say around you or how they look to you? Or do you change and you dumb down your blessing? Yeah. Yes, sir. And, and, and you know how we flaunt it, though, Brother Holmes? We don't give God the credit where it came from. 
See, when God rewards you, you're not flaunting because you're telling what God done for you. And in the essence, that's what God wants us to do is see, let the world know what he's doing for you. He says, that's your testimony when you can come in and say where he brought you from or what he delivered you out of. See, but when you sit down on what he's done for you, then it's like God said, I've done this mighty work in your life. And you're going you gonna to sit there like that. That's why pastors sometimes say, I can't believe y'all sitting down. Words, when he, what God has done for us, he said, you should be on your feet at all times. Matter of fact, just waking up this morning, you should have entered the door in a certain way. So we come here and we take it as just normal. But don't you understand somebody didn't wake up this morning? Somebody didn't get up. Nursing home full of people that people have forgotten. Took them there and dropped them off and just forgot about them. Out of sight, out of mind, or don't know what to do with them, or can't deal with them, or don't want to deal with them, whichever it is. You're so blessed that you're still able to function, go and do, and then you sit on what he's done for you. So when he says, when we say that, we're not flaunting what people do. I want to make sure you understand it wasn't my power that I achieved what I achieved. I did not do it on my own because I'm just like you. Only reason why I have what I have and do what I do and go where I go and be what I be is because of the love of God. And so as we make that known to people, it's never the flaunting. It's just making sure we understand who God is. So when Paul wrote this text, when he says rejoice for those who rejoice, he's actually talking to Christians and he's trying to get us to change our attitude of how we treat other people. Christians are the main people or the, the worst people in the world of lifting each other up. We have an issue in our hands that we cannot lift each other up. We won't lift each other up. We won't exhort nobody. People, are, people in the church are doing wonderful things. But because we don't lift each other up, they won't even tell you they're doing nothing. You'll sit on your blessing because what you figure is, man, they hating on me and I ain't going to say nothing. And we have to pull it out of people when they do good. There was a time in church they had bulletins when people did good. It was all over the bulletin. We started out with the youth around here. When the youth did good, we tried to make it out, make it known. We tried to celebrate them, talk about them, encourage them so they would be better than we were. As, 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 the, as the elders of the church or the old people of the church now, and I'm going to say elders of the church. I ain't that old, so don't go there with me right now, but I've just been around a long time. But as elders of the church, it's up to us now to lay groundwork. The road has been tore up. Somebody got to pave it back. See, we got to get to back being family where we can teach people how to be close to each other and how to exist with each other. We don't know how to deal with each other. And that's the problem. In this so, in this so dangerous in all areas, it actually drives a wedge between each and every one of us. And all because that I feel some type of way about you. The Bible paints a vivid picture of envy's devastating effects. If let go, or if you let envy grow in one's heart, the Bible says envy will lead to spiritual, emotional, and physical death. Listen to what it says. It says in Proverbs 14.30. Miss Paul, give me Proverbs 14.30. I know I'm messing you up, but if you don't mind, can you give me Proverbs 14.30? What he wants us to understand is, Envy is like cancer in a body. If you don't get treatment to it, we all know it'll spread all over your body. It'll break you down. It'll take over you in ways you don't understand. Listen to what it says. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy rottenness to the bones. When you have envy in you, when you have that spirit of envy in you that you allow to grow. Now, notice you allowing it to grow. When you allow this spirit in you to grow, that's what it does. It eats you up. It's just like the spirit of unforgiveness. If you allow it to go unchecked, it rottens your bones. It takes over you. It changes your disposition and most of all your attitude. You can't be the person that you're called to be. You can't say you're a Christian and then you're operating in this spirit and, and, and not trying to deal with it. 
So the thought is this, thought is this, thought is this. It says, if, you, if, you, if you're dealing with it, it says, how, how do we conquer envy? What do we do? What do you do to conquer envy? The very first thing you got to do is acknowledge you got it. Own up to your problems. Not just envy, but whatever your problem is. The only way you can fix an issue is you admit you got an issue. Until I admit, until I exist that I have a problem with envy, I'll brush it off. When you accept it and say I got a problem with envy, now I got a reason to go to the Lord. Now I can go to him because I've admitted something wrong with me. You'll never, you'll never take medicine for nothing you don't think you have. People don't take medicine because they swear they ain't got a problem. You got diabetics walking around, won't take the medicine because they say they ain't diabetic. And I correct you here. I'm not saying you're a diabetic. You're a child of God with diabetes. Identity crisis. We got to make sure we keep that in check. Never claim who you are. You always a Christian first, and then you have an issue with what you're dealing with. And then if you claim it or you start claiming it, you're opening the door for it to come to you. I ain't saying you can't have it, but I'm saying that's not you. So he goes back, goes back. He says this, says this. He says, here's the thing. There is a living translation that likens cancer to the bone. And in James 3, 14 through 16, teaches us this concept about that. James 3, 14 through 16. And we find this stern warning about the sin of envy. In James 3, 14 through 16. Sorry about that, Ms. Paul. I told you it's going to be a train wreck today. Listen to this, listen to this. It says, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it's earthly, sensual, demonic. Mm. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Mm. Listen to what he said. I, you, know, I, you know I'm going to ask you to bag up, don't you? He says, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, he's already letting us know that's something on the inside of man. It's not from up above. It's not from God. He didn't give it to you. He don't have any part of it. That's what we done picked up from down here in the, in, in the earth realm or what we call the world or the world system. It says, if you have this envy that you've got from the world, it says, don't, burst, don't boast or lie against the truth. When he says don't boast and lie against the truth, be honest with yourself. Own up to what you are. Own up the way you are. I got a problem with it. You'll never deal with an issue or a person until you have a problem. I had a problem with somebody last week. I couldn't let it dry. I couldn't let it go whole. I went and dealt with it, just like with the sin of unforgiveness. When somebody, when you have out against your brother, you go to him. Now, I'm telling you this. Sometimes you may have to wait a few days to let them cool off before you go to them. Sometimes you can't just go to them. The situation, dynamite just exploded. You can't run into the building right now. You got to bag up and let the dust settle. Then you go in and start picking the bricks up and looking for, looking for survivors. Sometimes when the same things happen, you got to bag up and let it cool down before you can go talk to them. See, but you got to make sure you go to them. You can't let it linger on. You deal with a situation. You deal with them, and you deal honestly and truthfully. And that's the issue in life, period. That's what the scripture he talked about in Mark where he says this type, of, this type of healing, you have to be prayed up. It didn't mean you stop and pray up. It means you should be prayed up all the time as a Christian. See, when, when you wake up and hit the floor in the morning, you should roll to your knees and start talking to God then. So when situations come up, you, I, they used to say it one time, they said, when you call God in the morning, don't hang up the receiver. Keep him on the line. Talk to him all day. I hit the floor, I talk to him. I thank him for getting me up this morning. Then when I get up and start doing my day, I still talk to him all day long. I run down the road, I'm thinking, I'm talking to him, going over scripture, but I never hang up on him. Then when I go to sleep, I just ask him to watch over me and then protect my mind while I'm resting. And we all know by scripture, God comes to you in the third watch of the night and talks to you then. Because that's when he gets you up in the middle of the night and you're wondering why you woke up. 
It wasn't no bathroom break. He was talking to you, trying to tell you something. You just ain't in tune with him to find out what he's saying. But when you stay in tune with him, when he wake you up, that situation that you were going through, he'll start to put it on your mind what you need to do about it. But you are so correct. We need to be in connection with God at all times so he can lead us and guide us. See, the Spirit was given to us, the Holy Spirit was given to us, the word of truth was given to us so he could guide us around the world. See, it's never about us. Again, we have this issue, we have this concept that we are so Holy Ghost filled or we are endowed with the Holy Spirit, but we don't allow him to work. See, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, now you have the Spirit of God in you, the Holy Spirit. But then you have to, you have to yield to him and allow him to work. See, many Christians have yielded God. We've accepted him as our Lord and Savior, but we don't give him any room to work. We want to do it our way when we want to and how we want to. So we're not allowed to allow him to do what he needs to do for us. So what he says this, what he tells us this, he says, the wisdom that does not descend from above, but it is earthly. Look what he said, the wisdom, the world's wisdom. He's talking about what we say to each other and how we, how we have made up laws and rules now. See, the world's wisdom that told us now is forget about them. If they don't care about them, they ain't happy for you, forget them. See, we'll come up with our own rules and laws instead of what God's saying. So the concept of the idea is this. Next one, 316, Ms. Paul. Let me have that one now. James 316. It says, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So he wants you to understand when envy is allowed to operate in you, not only envy is there, but other evil things are taking place in your life. See, we think just the spirit of envy, all you got, or I'm not really happy for somebody else. But you have to realize those other deadly sins are lurking in the midst of, the, of that too. See, it's like you open the door and let one evil thing in, and then other evil things start to come in with it. Then how do you exist with all of those in you? See, we got we to gotta watch it. We got to watch closely as Christians how we and what we do to those and how we treat others. See, the law of one another that we dealt with first and foremost when we started looking at this, when Matthew 7 and 12, it says how you treat people, you should want to be treated. I'm going to treat you like, like I want to be treated. I'm going to do you just like I want it done to me. And I think if you can get past that area right there, that would open the door for you to make it. But instead, is, I, wanna, I, wa I want you to treat me like I'm gold, but I, I, I want to do you like silver. See, I, I, I want you a little bit under me, a little subordinate under me. See, I want something a little better than yours, but I, I want you to have something just not what I got. We get rid of, we go buy houses because somebody else get a house like ours or somebody else get a nice house. Then we got to go one up them. I got to have a newer house because they done bought a house. Ain't nothing wrong with the one you just moved in. Just bought a car this year. Then he get a car, now I want another car. See, but that's the spirit in us that's working and lurking around. And Christians have allowed ourselves to go back more worldly than we've gone to the word. The world is controlling us. The wisdom of this world is controlling us. We came out of the world and brought the world with us. We left the world, accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We came through this door or we came in the family of God and we bring in the world back with us. Instead of leaving the world behind, we brought it back with us. So Paul has to sit here and retrain our minds is what he's trying to do in practical Christianity. He's trying to retrain our minds and teach us you can't bring that. You got to leave that outdoors. You know, when you was a kid, you know, here you pick up rocks and start playing. You try to bring them in the house. Your mom make you take them back outdoors. That's where we at. We bring it in habits and things that we did when, before we got into the church. And those of us, yes, sir. Paul understood as he wrote to the Gentiles, or in other words, the non-Jews, his teaching for us. We as the, the, the Gentile church, because we're not Jews, we're the Gentile church, Paul understood how he had to relate to us because we had been in the world looking at Christianity from the outside. 
See, we looked at the Jews from the outside and wanted to be like them, but it wasn't for us yet. See, before Paul, it wasn't, we, we, were, we were grafted in, but we weren't grafted in until then. But God knew. He knew his system and what he wanted to do and who he was going to send to bring us in. The problem is, is because as time has went, we've dropped what we've had and we picked up the other. And, oh, and, 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 I, don't like, and, and I hate to say it, but it, it's true. The early days, Christianity was stronger because they were more closer to the root of Christianity and before, it got, before we made it watered down. We've tore it up, we've destroyed it. Now somebody's got to put it back together. See, it's, it's got to be fixed. We got to start fixing it today, right now. You can't say next week, next month. We got to deal with it. Oh, yes, sir. Because the world has taught us that, that we know. See, that's the issue. We don't want to be taught because we think we already know. See, we already believe I know, I know how to fix this. I know how to fix my problems. I don't need nobody to tell me. Stay out of my business. I can handle that. I can fix that. That's what we are. And we, and you know what? But here's the issue. We are the ones that's responsible. See, Eve didn't mess it up. Adam messed it up. If you go back to Genesis and look at what happened, it says Eve ate the apple. Eve ate first. Nothing happened. Adam ate, and then their eyes were open. Didn't nothing happen until he ate. He was given the charge. She, she learned from him. He learned straight from God. He made the mistake. When he ate, he set us in a downward spiral. Now, men, and from that time on, men hadn't been where they should be. And I don't care how great a mother is in raising children, and mothers are great at it. God have gave them what they needed to raise children, but the absence of what God put in place was a man that hurts us. And we can't blame nobody but ourselves. And then when you go to a church and when you come in church, you look around and you see more women than men. Better than that, you go to homes and you see women running homes, no men now. Because we have lost our rightful place. So we've broken the system and somebody got to get back right. And the problem is, is we got to start training them. And now the key is you got to get them while they're small enough where you can start working with them. See, that's why we went to schools. That's why we went back to East Lake Elementary and tried to deal with the youth. Because you understand you got to get that mind. Train a child up the way they should go. It's easier to work with a young man than it is an old man. Because that old man do just what you said. You can't tell me nothing. I was a hustler. Been in the street. Don't you understand the concept of giving my money to God? That, that, that shook me. That shook me for a minute there. I'm like, give my money? Shoot, what are you going to give me? But, 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 the, but the thought was there. The world, that's what the world does. That's what Satan does. Satan divides us and conquers us. The church is scattered like this because that's what he wants. I don't want to hear what he got to say. I don't want to hear him. I'm going to tell you something. Back in the day I grew up, checks were given by the mailman, right? I didn't care who the mailman was that brought my check as long as it got there. Man, woman, boy, child, as long as it got there. If God found a way to get you the word, you should be trying to get the word. But we don't get it. Why? Because we ain't teachable. I think I know. I sit back and act like I know. That's the only thing about screens that's so dangerous. Back in the day, you says, go with me to Roman. Go with me to Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Now you got to do some work. Now you got to get used to feeling it and finding it. Now with screens, we, we call it up. Now everybody just sit there and wait for it to come up now. It's good, but it cripples. So now you ain't got to feel some kind of way because you don't sit there and wait for it to come up. But back in the day, you couldn't do that. Wasn't no screen now. When he said go to chapter 7, verse 12, you heard them pages. And, and people were scrambling trying to get it because they didn't want to be the one to look like they didn't know where it was at. 
but, 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 but watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. What did the pastor do with the youth? He brought them out here. What did he say? He teaching them the books of the Bible. He teaching them how to find the word of God, not to be bashful, pull it up in the word, not no phone, pulling it up on the phone. No, 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 open the word up. What if the power go out? What if your phone get broke? What you going to do? God said, give me a scripture. Give me a promise. And I, if you tell me a promise out of the word of God, I'll do it for you. Can you get it? Can you pull it up? So here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. We bring the world into the church. We can't be taught. That's the reason why we're where we are. So we bring envy in the church. We, envy is living in our homes. We, we got all these other issues that's going around. And what are we to do? What are you to do? First thing it says is acknowledge where your shortcomings at. I don't know. I ain't figured it out. Ain't nothing wrong with saying I don't know. The worst thing in the world is to say I don't, you know, I'm scared to say I don't know. You better say I don't know and get some help. Show me what I need to do. Help me to get where I need to get. But no, we want to sit there and act like we know it all and don't know nothing. And they ain't got two nickels to rub together. Ain't got the sense to pour, out a, pour water out of a cup if you write the instruction on the bottom. It says, we ought to recognize that pride is just the flip side of envy corn. Pride is the flip side of envy corn. Your pride won't let you rejoice with nobody. Pride go up before the description, what the scripture says. Pride takes us down through there because I got all this pride. I'm all of that. And you ain't number skin and win. If it wasn't for the breath of God in you, you wasn't good for nothing. He says this. He says this. He wants us to understand this. He says, put your pride aside and become what God called you to be, humble. Remember, we deal with humility. Remember, we talked about being humble. Humble yourselves unto the hand of God. Let God teach you and show you something. Then it says, we got to learn how to replace envy with compassion. You got to start learning how to have compassion for people. Understand people where they're at. Talk to people. Walk with people. It's the worst thing in the world. Satan, let, Satan allowed the pandemic. To, Satan, Satan, Satan did his part in pandemic. God allowed it as usual because it had to go across his table. God is a CEO. Satan is an imp out there. He says, I believe I, I, believe if I get him a, a, a disease bad enough, I bet I can tell your church up. God said, try it then. I got some true people out there. I know what they're going to do. You go on and try it and see what happens. So he took after us. Two years in running. Two years in running. I can remember Easter, the church would be jam-packed. I remember one time I had to put chairs down the aisles. And still couldn't get enough in here. We're scared the fire marshal come by. Made an extra row right here, chairs. Make sure row right there, chairs. And now look at us. Look at us now. See, because he's interrupted the natural flow of things, and he's got a chance then to shake the weak ones. But we who are strong are not to leave the weak behind. See, the charge is for those of us who are strong to make that call and check on your brothers and sisters and find out how they're doing, if everything all right or where they're at. See, no man left behind is where we're supposed to be operating from. You are your brother's keeper. God, we so quick to holler, I'm blessed to be a blessing, but we don't walk in that. We like to holler, I'm blessed to be a blessing. Okay, you've been blessed. When are you going to start blessing? This is all born out of learning how to lift others up. reason why we can't lift these others up because we still got problems we got to work on. And everything is against us because that's what Satan does. He comes at us with everything. He throws social media in there now. It's, it's wreaking, wreaking havoc all over the church all over the world. We do more conversations over that and they're having, causing problems from that than we do if you just talk to a person, find out what they got to say. Then you want to text me a message instead of talking to me. He says, let, 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 let envy, let envy die in your lifestyle or in your life to the point to where you recognize it, and you pray it down before it comes up. See, 
Envy will show his head at the worst time at the worst place. Envy never bothers you. Doing wrong never bothers you when you're by yourself. It always gets you in a, in a wrong place, in an inopportune time, and then it shows you for what you are. It gets you in front of people and gets you where things are happening, and then it shows up and it makes you actually gain, gain followers or people to go along with you when you do it. We as Christians or as people have been given charges or have been taught to be disciples. Rahom, so you, 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 you brought that several times. And we have to make sure you understand the, the definition of disciple is one who learns to disciple. Not just learn to learn, but learn to disciple. Learn to disciple means sometimes reaching out to the world, reaching out to lost brothers and sisters that have dropped off. See, because they quit coming don't mean that their, their salvation or their salvation is, you know, is lost. It just means they're lost. And it's our job to keep up with them and where they are as well as bring in new fish. But it can't be done by the pulpit. It has to be done by the congregation. We put too much pressure on this position, and what this position does is teach you what to do, and you go do the work. See, you, and until we step out there and start to say and do what the word says, then we'll never get where we got to be. See, now, the road is busted. We know it's tore up. Ain't no doubt about it. We know we messed up. What we got to do is start doing the right thing now. You got to have a teachable spirit. In other words, it says, you got to come get instructions on what to do. Go wherever instructions is. I ain't telling you where to go. If you feel you ain't getting instructions here, find somewhere where the instructions at then. Get what God say we need to do and then start to walk in it. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe you're in the wrong place. I don't know. But make sure you get where you can get what he wants you to do, though. The most powerful entity God placed on the planet is the church, not the building, the church, the ecclesia, the gathered body of believers, the called out ones, the ones I called out from the world to come do what I ask you to do. And here's the deal. Obedience is the issue because we don't want to obey him. You want to do what you want to do. It says I called you out of the world, and if you say you love me, then do what I ask you to do. We are so, we are so inanimate, we're so in, 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 a, in a place of we know so much and we do so much that we can't do what he asked us to do. And then each and every one of us is governed by our own set of rules, living our own ways. What I think is right, what I say is right, doing what I want to do. And nobody does what God says do. Then if we do what he says do, we want to change the I and the T around and make it what we want to make it out of it. Or say he didn't mean that. God's word said don't change it. It was exact and he meant exactly what he meant out of it. Well, make sure we understand. He says he wants us to understand that, that this, this thing or this envy was part of was partly a dangerous issue that blocks us from rejoicing with those who rejoice. He wants to get the idea, he wants the concept in your mind that we have to have compassion and learn how to live with those and actually adjust with those. Your brothers and sisters, when they are rejoicing, we should learn to rejoice with them. We're going to get to the point where when they are hurting, you're going to learn how to hurt with them. See, and one of the greatest things that can happen to you is when you're down and out, when somebody come up and put their arms around you and tell you they love you. They ain't got to tell you, you ain't got to tell them your business just to know they care. Just to let them put their arms around you, grab your hand, shake your hand, just to let them know that somebody else realized what you're going through. We go through things and we've isolated ourselves and the house cannot stand if it's divided. And right now, it's divided all over the place. 
I ain't talking about just New Horizon. I'm talking about church, period. And everybody worried about just their own and ain't worried about the others. That's where another problem is. I ain't worried about the rest of the world. I'm just worried about my world. We are, we are at a, we are at a power, we are at a point right now where I have to explain to you that it ain't that I ain't got no word. I just ain't got no more time. So, I see my, I see my choirs here with their smiling faces. Believe it or not, they smiling. They got masks on, but they actually smiling behind now. Smiling faces all in their places. So, what we going to do, we going to get ready. We going to turn this over to the choir. And if you come back next week, I guarantee you I'll give you some more of what you got today. Let's get ready for morning worship. Choir. I turn it over to you. <laughs> Don't make me look bad, y'all. I'm up here bragging on y'all. I'm going to rejoice with y'all. Come on now. Come on, y'all. Give them a hand clap. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Come on, y'all. this Easter Sunday crowd participation Sunday. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, so God has given us the activities of our lens and Hallelujah. we have our hands. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to ask everybody to go ahead and stand up. Let's get some blood circulating. We're going to put our hands together.
Oh, y'all thought it was okay to sit down? Y'all can just let go. <laughs>
Church, amen. amen. How does everybody feel? It is a blessing. First of all, let your mind just run back. Just be able to come into the church with a mask on is a blessing all by itself. In case you didn't know it, um, we could have become one of the victims with COVID and not be here. And, and yet we're blessed. And if you know you're blessed, just get up and give God some praise. Amen. We want to say thank you so much uh, for your presence here this morning. Uh, I want to thank praise team for sounding off the chain kind of remind me of old school we we get stuck and what we want or think we got to have and I told New Horizon a long time ago I'm glad God blessed me with both uh, I grew up in that formal hole in the hymn book church and uh, singing out the hymn book and then he sent me to a church that didn't have a piano nor organ and they had nothing but their legs to pack and brothers and sisters it's a blessing when you can just now when, when you can do that I, I want to see how many old schoolers I got up in here and got no shame to pat your feet.
Let's just say amen. At this time, where's Brenda? Had not been for the Lord on my side. Church, say amen. Amen. Just a, yes, it is. It's all right. Yes, sir. Just a few, few years ago, I, I had the awesome opportunity to take the time to counsel two couples that were deeply in love with each other. And over the years, I've had all sorts of couples. I've had some that started out and found out that they really weren't in love. Yeah. So I was honored to allow them to go their separate ways. But it is always a joy when you can find peace and harmony when two people don't have a problem sacrificing to deal with what it takes to keep a marriage alive. We're in trouble today because we have a misconception about love. We want to receive everything, but we don't want to give anything. The Hubbards has been a tremendous blessing to deal with and God turned around and blessed them with a little one and as much as kids can get on your last nerve in fact they can work all the nerves you got it comes down to one thing and one thing only is not going to last always. At some point, you're going to look back over these little toddler ages and realize that time has flown. And out of the nest, they fly away. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you a lie was rough raising four kids, but it's an awesome blessing just to hear the title, Paw Paw. 
I don't think anybody really understands. Yeah. But when you are acknowledged as a grandparent, yeah. erases all the blessings, yeah. everything, and then you realize it was worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask if the Hubbards would come down with Bella and the rest of the family. Because of COVID, we were not in a position a good while back to do the dedication as requested, but we had to wait until things lighten up. And they have. I want husband and wife in the middle and mamas and cousins and daddies all around them. can come on this side. Amen. We're going to wait on you. We not. In, this is one time. We're not in a rush. We're going to wait on you. I want to say a few things to all of you all in the family. Family is the most valuable thing God has blessed us with on earth. And I want y'all to hear me well. I don't care anything about confusion, problems, and issues. They're going to exist. In fact, every one of you standing here got a, your own personal problem. So all you got is family. Stay as close-knit as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Value each other. Never go to bed so mad with each other. You don't speak. Because nobody knows who's next in line. That they won't wake up the next morning. And there's nothing you can do. You can scream, you can holler, but it's too late. So love each other. And God has blessed with little Bella to the parents. Do the best you all can do in raising her. You're going to make some mistakes. There are going to be some moments you're going to wish, what have I done? Where am I going? But give it to God. And I promise you, when you do what God requires, You've done the best thing you have ever could do. There's one thing I'm going to ask of the two of you all as husband and wife. Never teach what you are not willing to become an example of. This is a new age, and children ask questions. So she will be quick to say, why did you tell me to do this? But you did this. I wasn't brought up like that. All the adults that's my age, right? we couldn't ask questions. But they ask questions now. So be an example. Watch what comes out of your mouth in her presence. Because it would be wrong to say, don't say that unless you sit down and say, I messed up. Okay, so be the best example. I'm talking about that, so I'm going to stop in my message this morning about being an example. That's the key to the unity within a family because the family's in trouble because we want to do what we want to do and yet expect an example to be set. She's going to follow what she sees, not what she hears. And I promise you, when you do your best, God will handle the rest. I don't know if she's going to stay in my arms long enough. <laughs> we will try.
Most gracious and all wise God, this husband and wife come now to give back to you what you have blessed them with. First of all, we say thank you for health and strength. Thank you for shelter over her head and an opportunity to be able to be in a family that's hers. They need your guidance. They need your know-how. God, they need a blueprint planted within their hearts and minds that they might teach and show her the right way to live. Then God, help us as a church that we might set the right example. Not in what we say, but in our actions. Holy God. In the hollow of your hand, nobody knows what lies ahead of Bella's life but you. It's our prayer that you will help them plan and map out, not according to their desires, but according to your will in her life. Be with her now. Be with them. Bind them so close together that never will there be a time of an argument over instruction and guidance as long as they focus on your word. Bless the entire family that when times are such like, like right now, bind everyone close together. Not just talking about, hey, cuz, but let's reach out and love and support one another. In such an era as this, we thank you for them all. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. She's yours now. Show her the way. Teach her now. But do it, God, through the instruments of the parents and this entire family. Do it through us as a church that we might set the right example. Thank you for it. For it is in Jesus' name we pray that every heart say, Amen. Amen. You all may have your seats. Bella, Bella, Bella.
Some of you all have never had your back up against the wall and didn't know which way to turn. 
but you end up calling on the name of the Lord and God just step. On the screen you will see our prayer of preparation before receiving the word. I'm going to simply ask that we read it in unison. It says, Dear Lord, I come before thee as an empty vessel. Open my ears that I might hear. Open my eyes that I might see. Open my mind that I might understand. Open my heart that I may receive your word. You may open your Bibles before I even get into the word. New Horizon knows me. I have never been a holiday preacher. Um, the problem I've had with holiday preaching is that we operate by the calendar. And to me, the word is the word. And we are right at a point in uh, our text where uh, we're talking more about how we should carry ourselves as a result of living a resurrected life. So you may open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. It is in this chapter that we have used as our theme for the entire chapter that Paul talks to us about what matters most. What matters most most. And I want you to understand I'm not going to go all the way back to verse 1 to bring us up to where we are. However, I will pick up on where we dropped off on last Sunday, but in order to be where we can clearly understand what is going on, um, I will start at a point and you check your notes to make sure you got exactly uh, what you should have, we are sort of in the middle and yet close to the end <clears throat> as it relates to the chapter. I do want you to keep in mind that prior to last Sunday, we focused on Paul's formula for life. Yeah, yeah. And that formula was actually found in verses 13 and 14. We have finished that. Verses 13 and 14. I'll quickly, uh, Sister Paul, you don't have to pull it up, just, uh, it, just follow me. Um, there were three things that the Apostle Paul wanted us to understand. And if we were going to be successful in dealing with life, he says there are three things you had to do. He says as, as it relates toward the past, you got to forget it. Toward the present, you got to advance. And toward the future, Paul says, persevere. You cannot lose sight now of those three major elements. Those are three things that is going to sort of carry us the rest of the way. Then after dealing with verses 13 and 14, I move you into a new section. And that new section is where we dropped off on last Sunday, and that is where we locked in verses 15 and 16. Verses 15 and 16. And what I wanted you to understand is that Paul now lays out a plan to every believer as he addresses the Philippians. These Christians, he wanted them to understand that if they were going to do anything with this formula... They had to manage it properly. And the way you manage the three-part formula, he says, is by conquering, by continuing. Don't reverse it. Don't talk about continuing in hopes to conquer. He says, conquer by continuing. Don't ever get to a point in life that you think you got the ability to park. Life is a process. And every day is a gift from God. And it ought to be your goal and objective to want to get closer to the master. In doing so, I laid out certain things. I told you that as we took a look closely at 
those verses that the first thing the Apostle Paul uh, laid out was that it was two major things. And what I want to do in order to properly outline it, that you can understand, I'm going to go back and reread All right. verses 15 and 16. And I just want you to hear it. Let it sink in your spirit as you take a look at how we pull it apart. Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Then in verse 16, he says, Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Now I want to back up right quick, because I shared with you on last Sunday, when you look closely at verse 15, in verse 15, Paul says in essence to us that he's saying to every believer, you got to have the same mind. All right. All right. The mind is extremely important because too many believers uh, seek to be depressed unnecessarily. Yeah. So you got to handle it properly. In that statement, I told you it was divided into two parts. And the first we looked at on last Sunday was the command. A command. It was a command. And within that command, I laid out before you that Paul presents three features, three parts to the command. Check your notes now, because I can't move forward until you get this. First, Paul says to us, as you look at the text, it simply allows us to understand that the command includes both Paul and his readers. Yeah, yeah. Notice what we zeroed in on. Paul said, let us. Yeah. See, that, that's powerful because so many believers like to separate themselves. And that's not what Paul is teaching. Paul is saying, we got to learn how to be together. He said, let us. If other words, if I got the medicine, I better make sure I take it myself first. Are you with me? Then we move from that first feature to the second feature of the command. So not only is it a matter where Paul says that it includes him as well as his readers, but it is a command that only those that are mature or is maturing can accept. This is not the place for puppy love. This is not the level for pettiness. That's not what Paul is talking about. Paul says in essence, if you are out of pampers, act like it. If you're no longer in pull-ups, deal with it. That means you got to face situations in life with the attitude, God got this. God got this. God got everything under control. Then there is a third feature that I want you to grasp. And that is, this is where I drop you off. I did not go into detail, but here Paul says, to have this mind is directed toward one purpose. Everybody with me? In other words, the statement itself reaches back in your Bibles. Paul now is reminding us of the idea of pressing toward. See, one of the, one of the problems that Satan enjoys doing is causing you to stop pressing. That's what he wants. He wants you to sit down and whine. He wants you to sit down and complain. He wants you to sit down and grumble. And y'all know how we grumble now. I done the best best I can do. And I don't know how I'm going to be able to make it. I, 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 I just don't know. Shut up. Shut up now. Shut up. No, no, no. I've already told you what it takes to press. If you hanging around folk that are lazy, you're going to soon become lazy. 
If you're hanging around people that don't want to go nowhere, don't want to do nothing, got no goals set before them, you're going to act just like they're acting. You got to learn how to separate yourself from that which is unnecessary. See, some of y'all got relationships that are unnecessary. You can speak to people, but the relationship is unnecessary. Can I tell you why? Because if you are not helping me move from point A to point B, I don't need to hang with you. In other words, Paul is saying, let us as Christians, as believers, keep on thinking with the same mindset. See... Y'all, y'all know me. If you hang in with stupid, you're going to think stupid. I would much rather for you to gossip about me moving to the next level than to stay on the level with you where you still going to talk about me. One of the problems of why we can't move up, Paul says, is that can't nobody tell you anything. You have all the answers. You you know it. It, You you, you, you gotta, (laughs) you know it. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, listen to what he says. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus, many Christians today don't have the proper mindset to move forward successfully. Am I making sense to anybody? And we're living in an age now where it bothers me. Because I could say something that could ruffle everybody's feathers up in here. But I'm going there. I'm, I'm going there. The government designed certain things to cause us not to be able to think. Are y'all with me? And as long as I never understood how a woman can receive more financially based on the more babies she had. Boy, y'all done got quiet. So that sets the, the, the goal, the premise. That as long as they, they said nothing about no husband. The key is, as long as you we will support. So what dummy wouldn't stay there? But Paul said, let this mind be in you. What you got to understand, sometimes you got to change your environment because you are living in the midst of negativity. And when folk you hanging with ain't got nothing, and you hear that all the time, you pause right there. Oh, I'm going to be out your own hair. I'm going to. You got to have the mind, the mind of the attitude that you don't know everything. First of all, their minds are destroyed. Listen, 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 listen to this statement. Got to get it. Their minds are permanently set, and I know the answer. You ever met somebody like that? Permanently set. Young folk, don't ever get to a point in life you got all the answers. Mama might be old-fashioned. Daddy might be out of step. But the point is, they got more under their belt than you got in your head. Listen to this. Minds are like parachutes. They only function when they are open. Oh. I done got hot. Listen to me. Listen listen to me. Open your mind. We're at an age now 
you, you, you can be pretty and cute and have lovely hair and the right complexion, the right shape, but if you got a closed mind, you're dummy. Boy, y'all, I may not be the best person you're going to leave here thinking about. Li 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 listen to this. The most difficult thing to open is a closed mind. It's hard to tell a person, baby, you ain't thinking right. Now, if you're in a relationship and he beating the hell out of you, and you're going to ask the dumb question. I, I don't know what I ought to do. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, come on. I love him. Well, first of all, something wrong with your love and it's misdirected. Because love isn't abusive. Paul, Paul, Paul takes the time. And acknowledges the first part. But then, if you look back at the verse, Paul said, hold it, wait a minute. There's a second part. This second part is called correction. Look at the verse. Look at the verse. Look back at the verse. Look at exactly what Paul said. Paul goes on and said, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this in you. Now, I need you to be careful with Paul's writings because the word if does not mean a hypothetical statement. Are y'all with me? That's not the language that Paul uses in the text. The word if presents not a hypothetical situation, but a fulfilled condition. <sighs> Look back at your Bibles. In other words, look at how tricky he is. He said, or oh, think otherwise. Yeah, yeah. If you got the New King James Version, that's what it says. Or oh, think otherwise. He's talking about those who linger yeah. along the way. In other words, listen to this. They have not the same mind as Paul. See, when two mess, when a, when a mind is in this direction and another mind is in that direction, something needs to take place. Are you listening to me? Because minds have to be together to go forward. Paul is talking to people who were trying to develop their own way of thinking, like in this day and age. This era in which we live now, it's not about what thus saith the Lord. It's what you read and what you interpret. <sighs> in other words, Paul says, if you're going to pursue the prize, if you're going to move forward for what it takes to obtain what's yours, you got to check this out. And I, I, I don't know what's wrong with us. We don't think no more. We just don't, don't think. You know, you, you can go to the mall, and you don't have to go to no strip joint. Boy, y'all might have quiet up in here. I, I'm, I'm trying to teach some facts. We look back at that old generation and say, well, they didn't know nothing. But we failed to realize they had values. They had class. Uh, they might have been uneducated, but they had status. Now we got all this edumacation and stupid. Somebody needs to tell a young lady, baby, leave something up to my imagination. But if you're going to reveal it all, why won't I date you? Boy, this ain't amen time. There are those that may disagree with Paul. So Paul didn't worry about the disagreements. Paul stayed focused. And he says in the text, we must have this mind. Watch him now. Paul saw in verses 13 and 14, and there were those who chose to disagree, but watch the text. Paul does not spend no time arguing with any of them. 
Don't waste your time fussing at somebody and talking to somebody who ain't going the same direction you're going. Let them go. You don't get nothing else just needs to cut some folk loose. Notice now, Paul has no desire to do that, but Paul merely says, God will reveal even this to you. So what Paul is saying is, I'm telling you, but there's somewhere down the road, God's going to make it known. See, sometimes you don't realize the value of what you cut loose until you're further down the road. Am I making sense to anybody? All right, all right. John chapter 7, verse 17. Listen to what Jesus said, okay? Jesus says, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether, whether it is from whom? God. Or whether I speak on what? My own authority. <sighs> Watch Paul. So Paul says, now we should have the same but what good is having the same mind if you don't have the same? Talk to me. That's the key. So watch him now. Watch him in the text. He says, develop the same what? Mind. That's what's wrong with the church today. We got too many different minds. Everybody. Everybody. Got to have the same mind, the same mind, same mind. What kind of mind? The mind of Christ. Doesn't matter. I told you young folk this morning. Doesn't matter who's talking about you. Don't react. Act. How do I act? Forget about what you said about me, and I check with God on what I need to do. All right. Watch Paul. Paul says, now you need to have the same what? Walk. Got the same mind. Now let's develop what? The same one. Watch him in verse 16. Watch him now. Be out your hair. Listen to what he says. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us what? Walk by the same rule and let us what? Be of the same mind. Now, notice in verse 16, Paul takes the time, sort of repeating himself. So that means it's got to be valuable. He lays out two important objectives. Two. You got to see it in the text. Two. Look at the verse. He states, listen to the first one. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained. What in the world is Paul talking about? Can I tell you? The first thing Paul says is that they should keep on the same course. Woo! The same what? Course. If, if I would ask you right now, what course are you on? Where are you headed? What is the sense of direction? If two people can't go in the same direction, then they need to go there. Boy, y'all don't got smart. Yeah, you, you, you understand what I'm saying? That's valuable. Now watch the wording that Paul uses in the phrase. Write down the word attained. You see it in your Bibles. That word attain. That word attain must be addressed. Why must it be addressed? Because it's different than the attain that we talked about earlier in the chapter. That is in Philippians chapter 3 verse 12. Totally different. The word in Philippians chapter 3 verse 12, which happens to be attain, means to take or appropriate. That's what it meant in verse 13. You ain't in 13 no more. You are now in 16. So in verse 16, it means to arrive at. Good God from Zion. You can't arrive at if you don't have a goal set. Boy, y'all better see that thing. What is Paul actually saying? Well, Paul is teaching that the Philippians had moved on a doctrinal trail. See, you can be on baby food for so long, 
The point is, you want to do grown-up things, but eat Gerber. You, you want what grown folk. Be careful now, because if you are still at the table, and this ain't got nothing to do with age, there are a lot of whole old folks. Stupid. Why? Because they're still eating Gerber. See, after a while, you ought to spit Gerber out. Why? Because you've been on it so long, if you ain't moved, stay there. But you got to advance. Go to the next level. How do I do it? Look at the text, y'all. The point is, Paul is saying to us, they had progressed along the road. Got to ask you something. When the pandemic happened, when it occurred, look back when it started and look at now and ask, have I grown? Has any changes come about in my life? Is there anything that I need to be mindful of? Right. I got a serious problem as your pastor. How folk can't see that when you're hanging with dummies yeah. and dummies, if, if I'm going to get in trouble, it's going to be my own fault. Yeah. 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 No, 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 no. If I'm going to be a fool, it's going to be my, by my own suggestions. But I'm not going to listen to somebody else's advice. I mean, come on. Being a fool is free. So why are you charging it to somebody else? Just accept it. The point is, own your responsibility. That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, I'm talking to these Philippians. They used to be on Gerber, but now they own greens and dressings and, 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 and collard greens and cornbread and neck bones. They're eating yeah. off a full plate. Yeah. Yeah. But so many Christians uh -huh. say they're off Gerber, but go right back. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm going to be out y'all's hair. Yeah. Let me set the stage like this, Sister Paul, so I can stop at the right spot. Paul is saying, so far as we have come. So Paul says to the Philippians, y'all know who y'all used to be. This is who y'all are now. But don't get happy in your now. Because there's so much more to come. In other words, don't park because you can rub two pennies together. Move on down the street a little bit where you can make a dollar and some change. Does everybody understand what Paul is saying? Paul is saying, don't park. I'm, I'm giving you a compliment. You have grown over the years, but you got much more ground to cover. Don't park. Don't, don't, don't park. Paul said, look at the, listen to the language. So far as we have what? Obtained. So he said, we reached a plateau, but we got much more ground to cover. I dropped by this morning to say to the church. Don't, 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 don't shout too quick. Look at yourself in the mirror and focus on the fact it took effort and experience to get to where I am. See, there are two types of folk running the race. There are people that got all mouth and no action. They got all the advice and nothing to show for it. I told y'all this before. If you're going to take advice from somebody... At least check to see what they got. Come on now. How can a, a woman who ain't never had a husband tell you how to handle one? And then you're going to take money and flop down at the, con at the conference and listen when you can come to church and get it for free. Oh, I'm going to be like that. Paul, 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 Paul is teaching us of the issue. 
Paul says, you, 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 you've grown, you've grown. I'm going to stop right there, Paul, Sister Paul. That you have grown, you have grown, you have grown, you have grown. But Paul says, recognize where you came from, but don't get happy and shout where you are because you need to look ahead and realize you got much more ground to cover. Put a P in there. Put, put a P in there. Put a P in there. And I know you sitting there going, well, what this had to do with, 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 with Resurrection Sunday? You ought to run life from a resurrected spirit. Some of us are still at the grave and ain't nothing in it. Do, 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 do. You, you at the grave. Ain't, ain't nothing that is empty. And you just hang in there weeping. What you need to do is find out where he who got out the grave went. And he's now available. All you got to do is open up your heart. And, and ain't nobody so dirty, he won't step in. Just ask the person sitting beside you. Every one of us sitting up in here were lost on our way to hell. Oh, but I'm saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized. Why? He was resurrected. Finished. Finished, finished, finished. Finished. Woo! Y'all gonna do whatever y'all. And if you don't, I, 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 I got one. I, I, ooh. Man, oh man. Dog. Listen, I know sometimes y'all look at me. Like I'm, like I'm crazy. But let me tell you something. Man, I can sit down by myself in the office. Yeah, yeah. No, right. Nobody in the building, just me and the Lord. Yeah. And the power of the Holy Spirit yeah. will move in the office. Yeah. And the other day I was just sitting, I had to put the pen down. Yeah. Just thought about how good God has been. Yeah. How messed up I am. But I think about his goodness. Come on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. Okay, okay. There's a lily in the valley. And it's bright as the morning star. There's a lily in the valley. And it's bright as In the valley, and it's bright as a morning. Yours a church open. You may come as a candidate for baptism. Amen. Christian experience and by letter, won't you come? Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Don't you know Sir. there's joy yeah. in the valley? Somebody found joy, joy in the valley, yeah. and as bright, bright as a morning star. 
Church, amen.